Hey guys, welcome to the Work the Web interview series where I shine the light on different strategies that you can use to help grow your business online in a way that makes sense for you. So there isn't only one like right way to take advantage of the online world. So I'm interviewing 11 experts that focused in on one thing and that one thing has helped them grow their business in ways that they couldn't even imagine. So today I'm here with our special guest, Katie, from Proof to Product, and we're gonna be talking all about how she focused in on starting and growing a podcast to help her grow her business. But before we get into that, let me just introduce myself really quick in case you're new around here. So I'm Mariah, a website strategist over at mariahmagazine.com, where I work with online business owners to help them get more website traffic and improve their SEO by creating a website strategy that's unique to their business goals and their ideal audience. So Katie, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. So hello, everybody. My name is Katie Hunt, and I am the founder of Proof to Product, and I work with physical product makers to help them get their products on the shelves of retail stores. So we help them build their product line, uh, sell wholesale, exhibit at trade shows, and um, market to buyers, and just really help them with all aspects of their business. Yeah, that is super awesome because, I mean, like, I personally don't make physical products, but I couldn't even imagine where to begin if let's say <laughs> I was doing something and like I wanted to get it in Target, for example. Yeah. Like I feel like that thought of doing that process just sounds so overwhelming. So yeah. I'm sure and, that and you are like a savior to so many people. <laughs> well, I don't I wouldn't go that far, but thank you. Yeah. I mean the process is so different across the board. So it's it's about finding what works for one as you were saying earlier, it's about finding what works for you, leveraging that and moving forward towards your goals. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So how did you get started in the online business world? Sure. So I actually had a product business that I started in 2008. Um, I was still in the corporate world. I was doing business and business development and marketing for law firms, actually. So I was working one-on-one -on -one with attorneys and oh, different like complete completely different. Yeah. yeah. So I, you know, I, it, that was a very intense job. It was a great job and I excelled at it, but like there was no creativity to it. So nights and weekends, I found myself like wanting to create and I started creating greeting cards and my mom's like, Hey, you should put those on like Etsy or something. Again, this is back in 2008. Yeah. And then it was like, Hey, if you're really going to do this, you should go exhibit at the national stationery show, which I had no idea what I was jumping into, but this is like, for those that aren't familiar with the trade show scene, that's a very, very large trade show in New York. Um, people spend thousands of dollars to go. I didn't realize this at the time. Holy crow. Yeah. And so, but it's where people went at the time. It was where people went to launch the wholesale market. So if you wanted to be working with stores, you needed to be there. You needed to be seen. At least that was the perception I had. Um, and so I did less than six months after starting my business as a side hustle still. Um, you jumped right in. You're like, what's up? We're all in. ready to roll. Yeah. And I had like, it would, I can say now that there was a series of disasters that happened, but I did walk away from the show with a few orders and a lot of lessons learned. And I wrote a blog post for a friend of mine right after that show of like five things I wish I had known before I had gone to that show. Yeah. And as things started, to, like as the show seasons would start rolling around, I would get tons of emails from other people like me, one or two person shops who are thinking about doing the show, but they wanted to know how much does it really cost and how do I get it all there? And like, can I really do this? You know? And yeah. a lot of the same kind of questions, some logistical, some financial, some just like, I need support, you know? And um, yeah, I feel like there's so many questions. Oh yeah. And I, and so I said, you know what? I don't have all the answer. I would sit actually for a while. I thoughtfully wrote everyone back as best I could during yeah. my lunch breaks and after work. But then I started to realize like, I don't have all the answers. Like I'm still pretty green in this too. I'm still figuring it out. So I, um, at the time, Twitter was the scene. We were all on Twitter getting ready for these shows. I reached out to a handful of my friends there who had different roles in the industry. We had a buyer and a sales rep and manufacturers. And I said, let's put our brains together. Let's start some classes. We did teleconference calls at the beginning because webinars weren't even a thing. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and we did. We had we did a series of four calls and I asked questions and moderated and I chimed in with my own thoughts. And we, you know it, it, it just took off. And the next year we started doing in-person conferences. We started doing online courses in a more webinar front webinar format, and then an, eventually an evergreen format. And, um, it, it wasn't until like 
2012 where I was like, okay, I can't have a stationary business and a day job and this co- essentially coaching business, you know? Yeah, that's and, like a whole lot. Um, and I had two kids under two years old at the time. So it was a little bananas. Um, and so I, I had eventually left the day job and then in 2016, let go of the stationary line. And I've been doing this now coaching businesses for nine years, almost nine years, We've helped thousands of companies, you know, reach their definition of success and hit the goals that they're trying to achieve. Uh, And it's been so rewarding, super duper rewarding. That's so awesome. Your story is so inspirational. It's just like, (laughs) it's basically, I mean, I feel like we've touched on this in like a few of my other interviews. It's basically find out where your people have the problems, find out how you can help them absolutely, and put it together. But like, you have to make sure that you're passionate about it. So it's like you obviously cared enough. It was oh, like yeah. some underlying passion. So where you yeah, were like, well, so, well, so, okay. I should also preface this by saying the job I was doing in the corporate world is very much in line with what I do now with my clients. Um, and I have two MBAs and mar- one in marketing and one in finance. Like I was heading up that corporate ladder. Like it was, and, but I wasn't feeling fulfilled in that corporate gig. You know, my skills were great and I was doing a wonderful job and they were happy with my performance, but I wasn't fulfilled. And now I am doing work with an industry I feel so passionate about because I had a foot in it for a long time. I am able to leverage my education and my corporate experience and my, my grunt work experience in my business to help others that are trying to come up in this world. So yes, I feel very fortunate to do the work I do and that people allow me to play a small part in their success. So I feel very, yeah, that's so awesome. So in terms of like growing the online portion of your business, did you like run into hiccups or growing pains when you first really started out in like that section of it? Oh yeah, for sure. Don't we all like along the way? I, yeah, we hit, I mean, at the very, very beginning, I, like I said, we were doing teleconference calls and I remember feeling like we need face-to-face time. We need to do webinars, but like even the amount of technology that's available now was not then it was like go to meeting and it was like very expensive for a small startup business, you know, like all these things that have evolved. Now you can hop on zoom or whatever and it's easy peasy. But, um, yeah, I mean, that was a hurdle for a long time. Time management was really hard for me just because, you know, I had a a young family and a day job and I was trying to, yeah, I was trying, I mean, I'm a very driven person, but I also like no one can do, so many things and do them all well, like balls are going to drop. And so I was especially like you you add in, I don't know, like doing the dishes. Right. And then it's like self care, like things that really do matter in life besides work. A hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. Trying to, trying to balance all of that. Yeah. And I think part of it was me just trying to figure out where do I want to spend my time and energy and what's the most viable business? Because I knew down in my, like deep down in my heart, like I was, I was not going to stay in corporate. I was meant to do my own thing. And, but it was like, do I want it to stay in the product world or do I want to kind of transition into this, you know, uh, take my corporate skills and transition that into more of a coaching program. Yeah. So you say that like one of your biggest hurdles is probably just like balancing it, like trying to find a balance that actually makes sense for, I mean, you specifically, but also like your family and like your passions and just everything. Yeah. So uh, to get back to your question, balance was definitely a challenge. I think too, um, at the beginning, I felt like I needed to do everything myself because I didn't really have the budget to hire people. And so, but you know, again, when you try to do everything, you don't do it all well. And so, um, you know, relinquishing some control was a big learning curve for me. And I have a small but mighty team that works for me now. And the amount of stuff we're able to get done in a single day, it's astounding. Um, I think that, so time management, balance, all of that was definitely something I struggled with, you know, and then of course there's, there's a little bit of the imposter syndrome that pops up of like, am I the right person to be teaching this? You know, at the early days, I was kind of learning alongside of our students. I was just kind of the one moderating to some extent. And, you know, now I am leading everything and teaching Mm -hmm. everything. We bring in other experts as well. It's not all me, but, um, there's a shift that happens as your business grows. And so I think, the, the challenges you face in the earlier days of your company are different than once you've been doing it for a little while. And I anticipate five years from now, the challenges I face then are going to be, you know, even more different that I can't even yeah. anticipate what they are yet. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, especially in business, I mean, life is forever changing and then you add business into that and it's like, you just kind of got to go to the flow, go with the flow and just 
learn as you go. And I feel like that's honestly like one of the best parts of owning a business yeah. is like, oh I gosh. have, I have the creativity and the freedom to be able to like mold my business into exactly what I want as I go. I a hundred percent agree with you. The autonomy and the agility. This, this is always what I talk about with my clients. Like the fact that we can create whatever we want to create. And if some, if we try something and it doesn't work, we throw it to the wall and it doesn't stick. We pivot. We try something else. We do yeah. it differently. We and try we again if we want. Yes. And the freedom and flexibility too. I mean, again, I have children. Now I have four. In the early days I had two. Um, and, and, you know, I was able to go to award ceremonies this morning and do all these things. Like I wouldn't have been able to do that in the corporate world. So I, you know, again, as we grow, there's different challenges and hurdles we face, but I'm feeling like I'm in a really great spot right now. That's awesome. So mm -hmm. how did you come up with the idea to start a podcast? Yeah. So this came from like more of a need that okay. it was, it was a want for a couple of years, but then it became a need. So in 2016, I taught four classes for Creative Live. I spoke at eight different uh, speaking engagements throughout the US and in Mexico. I had my own programs we were hosting and I was pregnant with and delivered my fourth baby. And at the end, uh, and she- So much Oh, stuff. it was insane. It was insane. I look back and I'm like, why did I do that to myself? You know, like why? Yeah. I mean, the creative live thing happened in the spring and that led to a lot of speaking requests for the fall. I had her in May, but I mean that whole fall, I was, it, it was, it was hard. And so I got to the end, I still had my product business at the time. So at the end of the year, I was tired. My family was tired and I was like, I can't do this. Like I still want visibility. <laughs> excuse me. I still want to be out like teaching people and helping people, but I need to do it from home. And so, yeah. um, you know, I went through like, okay, well, what kind of stuff could I do? And more online classes, it's not. And I'm like, you know what? I love talking to people. I love telling stories. The idea of a podcast had kind of been percolating in the back of my mind a little bit. And I said, you know what, this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to say no to speaking. Engage I made three tough decisions. I said no to speaking engagements for all of 2017. And actually I've continued to say no to most. Um, I, uh, hired help and I, for, well, I discontinued my product line and stopped selling my product line. And I started hiring more people and asking for more help, both in our personal life, as well as in my business. And, but the podcast was the one piece of this whole thing that was like, it's going to continue to give me visibility. I'm going to be able to help more people and I'm going to use it as a platform to lift up our community and share their stories as well. So, um, yeah, that was where I landed. And so we launched the podcast in May of 2017 and we've recently hit 105 episodes and 300,000 downloads and like all these crazy things that, so it basically more, and we changed my company name to proof to product, which was the name of the show. Um, yeah. so it, was a very pivotal decision in my entrepreneurial journey that has led to amazing things I didn't even anticipate. Yeah. And like, I mean, that goes with, I mean, the entire theme of this interview series, it's just, it's proof that like when you focus on one thing and you do that one thing, well, yeah, that is where you're going to get most of your results from. But I know like a lot of, probably a lot of people watching, you know, maybe a little bit newer to the online world or like in that space to where they're kind of like, I don't know which direction I want to stick with yep. because they're getting told that they have to do everything. Oh, please don't do everything. You're going to kill yourself in the process. <laughs> please. Yeah, it's literally like, you know, you need this and you need this and you need this. And like, yeah. you know, some of them do intertwine. Of course. But it's like focus really on that one thing. And like, like you said, you said no to this thing, yeah. this thing, this thing, and all of these things coming up. And I'm sure that, that was extremely hard. Oh, it's it was like, so hard. It was such a difficult decision to make. Yeah. But and then you the just rewards put, have been amazing. Yeah. And then you put the effort into that one thing and now it just exploded and you're yeah. like, whoa, who knew? Yeah. Yeah. And it freed me up in a lot of other ways too. You know, when I was traveling for work, then I was able to be a little more selective in how I was spending my time away from my family, whether it was going to a mastermind retreat instead of a large conference or whatever it is. So yeah, it, it's been pretty impactful and pretty amazing. And it, I agree. It's it, it, for my internal, like internally within my team, we talk about it as an example of where, when we focus on one thing, how well it can do. And, yeah. you know, so yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that leads me into the next question. So what's your favorite part about having and growing your podcast? 
Um, I really enjoy talking with everybody and hearing their startup stories and telling telling their stories to the world, sharing them with the world. And, you know, I, I really like to talk about all of it. I like to talk about things they struggled with as well as sex successes they've had. And I kind of, I like to dive into deeper areas, but I like to pull out some things that people may not know about them and, you know, just different parts of their entrepreneurial journey. So I think it's the connections I'm making and the relationships I'm continuing to build. Uh, we, I love highlighting our alumni that have come through our program and showing their success they've had and not in like a testimonial way of, I did this, we did this, but more yeah, of just yeah. look at them, like, look how amazing they've done. And, yeah. you know, and, you know, we do, of course, like I said, highlight the, that it's not always roses, but, um, you know, I just, I find that it's helping a lot of people and it, it make, I'm very proud of the work we're doing. I'm glad to hear that it's a free resource. I, I, I'm glad we have a free resource that's making such a big impact for other people. Yeah. Yeah. That's so important. Especially, I mean, in business in general, but especially in the online world when it's like in business, you're, so, you're kind of like local, let's say, yeah. but then you, it's the online world and it's like, huh, you're not, you're not just local anymore. No. So it's like trying to block out a lot of that stuff and really just focus in on the things that are inspirational, motivational. Yeah. So you can have that drive and that ambition to go ahead and push you to where you need to go. Yeah. I think that that's so important. Yeah. And we focus on tactical too, you know, of like, here's how they did it. And, um, so you can do it too, you know, yeah. and, and, or this is how they did it. Maybe it's a good fit for you. Maybe it's not, you know, but they can listen and learn and decide what to apply to their own business. Yeah. I think that's really helpful. Um, so for people that haven't listened to your podcast before, yeah. would you say that most of your episodes, like our interviews, they are. The large majority are, of them are interviews. Um, I kind of compare it to how I built this. It's it's similar in that we tell startup, startup stories, but it's for smaller companies. It's for people that are, you know, I and mean, we've had some large brands on the show as well, but it's mostly people like you and I who are running smaller shops, uh, smaller one or, you know, when I say shops, I mean businesses, but yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> excuse me. Um, and, you know, it's a very relatable story for those of us running small businesses. We can understand the triumphs they've had, the, the struggles they've had. And um, yeah, so I would say that it's more interviews. I do some solo interviews and solo episodes at times talking about key things that people are asking about in our community. Um, but for the most part, it's interviews. Okay. Yeah. So then you also like use like your community where people are having more problems that you didn't even realize or something, you kind of use the podcast as a platform to go ahead and address those. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah. We have a free Facebook group that was created for the podcast, but you know, I always ask them, Hey, what are you guys working on? What do you need help with? And I'll sometimes pull things out. Sometimes I get people submitting questions to me over email and I'll say, Hey, let me tackle that on the podcast. Cause if you have that question, other people probably do too. Yeah. And, yep. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's mostly interviews and it's, um, it's so, a little bit broader of a storytelling, but we do try to dive into specific areas where we can. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I feel like, especially like the questions that people ask, you don't know what your audience is wondering unless you ask them what they're sure. like, what questions do you have? And I feel like a lot of business owners can like we can sit here and we can try to figure out what people are having problems with. We can try to figure out what their questions are, but the only way to honestly find out is to ask them like, guys, what are your questions like about this topic? So I think that it's just, it's a really great way to figure out like where they are in their head because like where you think they are and where they really are could be completely different. I 100% agree. And I think as a business owner, it is truly our responsibility to check in with our audience on a regular basis to find out where they are. One example of this gone wrong is um, we recently renamed the company to Proof to Product and created a new website. And um, I started this process a couple of years ago and I kept hitting walls. Like we kept having like problems with vendors. And we just had a number of issues and um, which I shared on the podcast at one point. Um, but my point is, I think I was trying to build a, at that point or in the earlier days, I was trying to build a site that was for the audience I thought we had, but mm -hmm. really my vision for who we were working with, or I'm sorry, my audience had outgrown the vision of who I thought they were. And so by going in and checking, and so by going and checking in with them regularly, yeah. you're going to be creating content that's suitable for them. You're going to be speaking to them in a, in a way that resonates with them. And 
sometimes we get in our own heads and we think, oh, this is who I'm speaking to and this is where they are in their business. And this is kind of, you know, the struggles they're having, but maybe they're beyond that already, or maybe they're, they're, they haven't reached that yet. And, and maybe you have multiple audiences instead of like, we thought we had two audiences. It turns out we have about four. And, um, and so now we're speaking to each of them in a different way. And it's, it's, it's been a lot more impactful because you know, we're talking to them rather than guessing what they need. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, like, that's what I tell my clients too, when we're working on their website, when we're coming up with the strategy of all this stuff, it's all ideal audience and like, not just what, who you think they are, but who they actually are. Right. And sometimes we do have to make assumptions, you know, if we don't have some of the data or we don't have people to provide feedback, but once you do get rocking and rolling and you have people that are engaged with what you're doing, check in with them on a regular basis, even if it's once or twice, you know, once a year, or once every other year. Yeah. I think that that's awesome advice. Um, So when it comes to the podcast, what's the biggest issue that you ran into? Maybe like when you were starting out? Sure. I think I, yeah, when we were starting out, I was a little bit concerned about the tech side of things, you know, working with iTunes and how do we edit this? And like, I mean, I can have a conversation with people and we figured out easily how to record these things, but after they're recorded, what do we do? And how do we set all that up? And what what about hosting? You know, I mean, all that felt a little bit overwhelming. And um, so I knew right away, that was something I wanted to get help with. And so I outsource all of that to Caroline from Caroline Creates. She's wonderful. And if anyone's considering starting a podcast, I highly recommend she be your first stop because I basically approached her, said, this is what I'm trying to do. She gave me some tips on how to record it, what kind of microphone to get, what kind, like all the tactical stuff at the beginning before we were even ready to roll. And then once we were ready, she handled all of the like connecting with Libsyn and all these other, like all the tech stuff that really... I didn't need to know. And I didn't know, like, I didn't want to have to learn again or learn for sure. First place. Um, she took care of all of it. She was great. She was a wonderful, like she's tactically excellent, but she's also a really great mentor for those starting out in podcasts. And she's still my editor today. Um, that's awesome. Yeah. I'll definitely leave the link to her website. Um, watching for like in the description below. So if you guys want to find out more about her. She's great. And then the other thing that I knew going into the podcast, which I think a lot of people don't think about Mm -hmm. is that you, in order for it to be successful, you have to be consistent, just like Mm -hmm. blogs or social media or any of that stuff. You have to be producing consistent content. And so I knew we needed a strong workflow. Um, and I knew we needed to try to batch, you know, batch record and batch edit and all these things. And I knew I wanted a buffer. I knew I wanted us to have a good, you know, few weeks that were pre-planned and scheduled and all that. Um, so that if life happened, if somebody's kids got sick or, you know, whatever it might be, life happens as it is, like we would be able to still keep trucking and we wouldn't fall short. I did not want this to be the kind of thing where our shows air on Tuesday and we were on Monday, like pushing go. Yeah. Um, yeah. I feel like that's, that's super stressful when you oh, yeah. do it at like the very last minute. It's just like, and then you start to like resent what you're doing that you once loved, but it's like putting all this pressure on yourself. Yeah. And I like, I also just don't operate that way. <laughs> you know, like it's not, I know some people probably do it that way and it works just fine for them, but for me it doesn't. So we, so going into it, I knew, okay, I, I want to batch my time and batch my recording. I want us to create a really strong workflow so that we're working ahead and everyone knows what their responsibilities are. I also knew at the beginning, I wasn't going to be able to do this alone. So in addition to Caroline, I have a PR person that helps to book me on other people's podcasts or interviews. Okay. And she also does outreach for our show. So she'll invite people to come on our show. Um, yeah. And uh, visitors watching, that is Brittany. Yes. So I actually interviewed her for oh, public goodness. relations for the interview series. So if you guys are interested in learning a little bit more about the PR side of things, totally check out her video too. Brittany is amazing. She has been with me for a long time and she is, I can't speak highly enough. Like she's just so proactive and wonderful. So she does that. And then we also have an admin that takes care of like social graphics and show notes. And, um, you know, at, at the very beginning I was doing all the show notes and we were creating graphic templates that we could reuse and think like, so this workflow has like changed over the last yeah, few years. Yeah, for sure. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it I'm, I know there's people out there that do all of this themselves. They edit it, they upload it, they do the graphics, all of it. But I knew that this podcast was a marketing tool for us and I needed to be involved in the interview process. And that was my piece of this that really, truly needed my time and focus. 
But I also have other aspects of the business that we're running. So I knew I wanted to get people in to make sure that once we recorded things, it was kind of, you know, we had a system in place to get it out the door and done. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's really, really helpful, especially like how you break down the tasks to give to certain people. Yeah. I think that, you know, it's really nice to know that you don't have to be hands-on with no. every part of it if you want to do a podcast. And I feel like it's, you know, it's the same with a lot of different aspects in business. Like we always kind of want to be really hands-on until we are so mm -hmm. hands-on. And then we're like, oh crap, how do we get hands off? Right. And my, so my hang up is I like to, I'm, I'm a learner. I like to understand how these things work. And so yeah. at the beginning I did want to, I didn't want to be involved in the tech stuff, but I wanted to like the show notes and the graphics. And I wanted to see what to help us build the workflow, but also so I could understand what our different processes yeah. were. Yeah. Um, and then once I realized, okay, like we can create a system for this. We can, you know, instead of using Adobe InDesign or Illustrator for our graphics, we can put this in Canva and we can have yeah. you know, somebody do it there. And like, so it is a constant improvement and streamlining things, but to your point, like we don't have to have our hands in everything. And frankly, as a CEO of our business, we shouldn't, you know, yeah. there are things that we should be outsourcing. The other thing, and I know this isn't about hiring, but I just want to mention, yeah. I think people have a real fear around hiring and they think, oh gosh, I have to hire somebody with, you know, full-time hours and benefits and do payroll and all this stuff. That's not the case at all. You know, no. my entire team, they're contractors. Some of them work very few hours for me a month, but they have very key roles in my business and they have very yeah. like specific responsibilities. And, um, so there's a lot of people out there that want flexible work. So don't feel like if you want to start a podcast that you have to do it all yourself. And yeah, there's lots of help out there and I'm, I'm happy to share the resources in the description as well. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, we would love the resources. And then I also interviewed somebody about like growing her team and like doing contracting work. So guys, yeah. if you're interested in learning more about that, check out the interview with Miranda because she went through a whole ton of really awesome information. Awesome. Um, I can watch that too. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's really helpful. So yeah. when you first started out with your podcast, how did you get listeners? Yeah. So we, leading up to it, we created like, um, we created a Facebook group that was kind of like any friends of mine, colleagues, business people, we, we called it a launch group. And that was where I kind of was like, okay, we're working on this. Here's what we're doing. We shared like behind the scenes stuff. I did talk about it in my regular business feed too, of like, Hey, we're getting ready to launch this thing. If you want to see behind the scenes or you want to be one of our cheerleaders, so to speak, when it launches, yeah. it wasn't like a formal street team sort of thing, but yeah, but you're just, you're asking your people for support. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And if you want to hear more about it, come join us in this group and I'll put updates in there. And I did use that for like market research of what kind of topics are you wanting? I used it for, Hey, what do you think about this? Or, you know, this is what I'm working on behind the scenes. Um, and it was really, it was helpful for me. And I think people really enjoyed hearing about the logistics as we were kind of getting ready to unroll it. Um, so that was one thing we did. And then we did, um, we did create, I think it was three, we did launch with three or four episodes. I can't remember how many it was at the beginning, okay. but it was in, we put an intro out early. And then when it was launch day, we did three or four episodes all at once. And the reason you do that is, um, it helps you with rankings. If you get more downloads. So let's say one person comes and listens to your podcast. If they listen to all three or four episodes, your download numbers go up straight away. Oh, and that kind of okay. flags to iTunes and whoever's doing their rankings that, Hey, this is a podcast that garners attention. So yeah, one thing people always try to get on is a new and newsworthy list in iTunes um, or Apple podcasts. And um, they do that by front loading a handful of episodes at the beginning and then telling people to leave ratings, leave reviews and listen to everything. So the download numbers go up. Um, okay. Yeah. So there's some, but again, I didn't know any of that. Caroline yeah. was the one that taught me all that. <laughs> so yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. So definitely if, if you're thinking about starting a podcast, front load them, yeah. ask for reviews. Those people that are listening, ask them for some feedback, leave a review on iTunes or whichever platform that they're listening yeah. to. So I know that, you know, like even with website strategy and SEO, it's like those Google reviews, they matter. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing is we did connect with, you know, Stitcher and SoundCloud and Google play and like all the different places like Apple podcasts is definitely where we have the bulk of our listeners, but there's so many people listening in other places or with yeah. Android phones or on our website even. So we made sure that our show was accessible 
like pretty much everywhere we can put it. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, speaking of your website, did you add anything to your website to help you grow your pat your podcast following? So we did, uh, we created a separate section at the time when we launched, we created a separate section of the site that was just for the podcast. And we did have, um, like a separate mailing list opt-in type of thing. But frankly, I felt, I feel like we fell short there. I think we could have done a better job of having, at first we tried to, we made pretty, um, transcripts of every episode and we okay. thought, okay, well, well we'll do that and people can download that. And we had people downloading them, but that's not enough of an incentive to them to get the, like to have them give you your, their email address. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, we, I think we put together some other worksheets that were kind of more like, uh, you know, not tied to any specific episode, but okay. tied to what all the, the other programming we do. So in my opinion, we didn't do a strong enough, like launch in that area. But I think if I were to go back, I would choose one thing that's really juicy, that really is educational and teaches people what you're trying to, the message you're trying to get out in your podcast. Um, and, and mention that in your episodes, cause, because yep. if you find one that's a little bit more general, and I feel like that works with like opt-ins too, like when yeah. you're writing blog posts and stuff like that, have an opt-in where people can give you their email address, but make it general, mm -hmm. but also focused on like yeah. how you help them but general enough so where you can mention it in a few different places without being so specific. Absolutely. And we did leverage the podcast. I mean, I did ads for our program. So our paper camp conference and our e-course and things like that, that we do our signature programs. Uh, when we did, you know, quick three day sales or pop-up sales on certain things, we'd talk about that. So we definitely do, we are selective in when we air certain episodes and what ads we tie to that. We also have some paid sponsors that have purchased ads. So Gusto was working with us and some others. Um, that didn't come until maybe a year into the podcast at that point. So really we were leveraging it for our own marketing and we still, okay. that's our main focus. Yeah, that's really interesting. So do you, so kind of like the goal of the podcast, is it to bring people to your website? Yeah, the goal is, I view it as a marketing and visibility thing. It's, okay. it's uh, a way for us to share. Well, one, it's a way for me to teach people virtually. Two, mm -hmm. it's a way for us to highlight our community members and the successes that they've had, which is really proof of our programming to some yep. extent, even though it's indirect. <laughs> We're not saying, you know, this is why you need to come to paper camp or whatever. Um, but yeah, I really want I want it to warm up people that may not be ready for our programming and let them know that there is a world out there that's meant for them. I feel like there's so many resources out there for service-based business owners and there's mm -hmm. not too many for product. And that is who we talk to. And I want them to know that we're their number one stop, whether they plan to sell wholesale or do a show, we've got resources for them, even if they don't want to do any of them. Okay. Yeah. So are there specific things that you talk about or include in every podcast that kind of helps people to take action after listening? Yeah. I mean, we have, we should probably do a, a better job of it. We have the ads that are, you know, we, we rotate out different things based upon our sales seasons, but we do ask people to do, I don't have like a, a final like homework assignment for anyone on the podcast, but we do ask them to leave ratings and reviews and stuff like that. Okay. But we, yeah, I mean, even, even those like smaller actions, like those are easy enough for people to do, even if they're in a hurry, if they're in the middle of something, you know, while they're listening to the podcast, yeah. it's yeah, like, hey, call leave, leave, us, like, leave yeah. us like a quick review on this. Exactly. And we, I don't really like to do what they call mid rolls, which are ads in the middle of the episodes. I mm -hmm. find them a little bit distracting, but, um, we have done them. Um, I'm not saying we won't do them. It's just, I prefer not to, yeah. um, although they work better than the end because by the end, everyone just kind of like turns off. Um, so, but I, yes, we have different call to actions on each episode. Um, and we do tie it back to our own programming and freebies to opt-ins. We have, um, we've got a lot of free courses people can download on our website and watch. So, um, we do promote those as well. Okay, cool. So this is just like a question that I had when I'm listening is yeah. do you have most of your listeners listen like the day that the podcast episode comes out or is it like they kind of start to trickle in and the bulk of them is after? Um, so it's been fascinating. I, I kind of am a numbers geek and like to look at the analytics for this stuff. Um, we definitely get a ton, not a ton, that's an exaggeration. We get a lot on the first day. Um, and part of that is because a lot of people subscribe to our show. So when okay. people subscribe, it automatically pushes the next show into their phone basically. Um, and that, I think that counts as a download. Um, 
I don't think they have to actually listen to it to count as a download. Okay. I could be wrong on that though. Um, but so we do have an inflect, like you can see every Tuesday, the numbers spike up and then, spike you know, up. the rest of the week we do have people listening. We do have consistent numbers, um, but there's always a spike on Tuesday, but okay. it is interesting. I mean, we have people, I got an email from somebody the other day who's like, I just found your podcast and I, you know, I'm, we've been at it for two years. She's like, I just found it. And oh my gosh, I'm starting at the beginning and coming for it. I'm like, you don't have to start at the beginning, but like jump around, jump around to what suits you, you know, like whatever yeah. topics or businesses are of most interest to you. Um, but we have had a lot of people that email me and say, I binge like, you know, five episodes on this, you know, road trip I was on or whatever. So. Oh, that's so awesome. That's like such great feedback to hear. Oh my gosh. It makes my day every time I hear from our listeners, to be honest. I mean, whether they're leaving a review or a rating or even just emailing or, you know, sending a message on Instagram, it just, it, it, putting together a podcast on a weekly basis is a lot of work. I mean, there's a lot of behind the scenes coordination and things that go into it. There's expenses tied to it. You know, we don't charge for it. And I feel like each episode is its own little class in some ways. Yeah. And um, so to hear the feedback that people are enjoying it and that it's helping these like not only startup business, like very beginner businesses, but seasoned companies, it just really, mm -hmm. it, it makes, it makes my day. That's awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, guys listening, if you hear, I mean, if you're watching a YouTube video, if you're listening to a podcast, if you're reading a blog post, leaving these comments for the people that are creating them, it's your, like, it makes a world of a difference, especially, yeah. you know, when the businesses maybe aren't as big as like Gary V or right. something where like, he's probably not reading all of the comments, but like business owners like us, like we see that and we're like, yeah. And we're like, I am. like that's, that's amazing. Like yeah. it just, it, it just means so much. Um, it does. It means so much. And it helps a show get visibility too, just like on YouTube or, you know, the podcast, like the more ratings and reviews and comments and things like it does. It's that algorithm we talked about when you front load it at the beginning, you know, it, it helps get more eyeballs on it, which then leads to more opportunities and more, um, I tell people too, like it enables me to get different types of guests. Like sometimes I do like to bring in bigger businesses and if mm -hmm. they see us on the rating, you know, the ratings or reviews or the charts, then they're more likely to do it too. So, um, you know, it's just, it, it's helpful and it lets yeah. us know you appreciate what we're doing too. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, so if there was an online business owner and they were thinking about starting a podcast, what's the very, very first thing that they should do? Um, I want them to think about their why behind it. I want them to think about what kind of content they want to cover, what kind of, uh, whether it's good, what kind of format. So is it going to be an interview show or a solo show? I want them to think about the timing. How long will it be? I try to aim for 30 to 40 minutes at most because I want people to listen on their commutes or, you know, keep it kind of short. There's some people that do 10 or 15 minute shows okay. solo, you know, like you, there's some people that do an hour or more, you know, and so it's up to you, but really I want you to get organized before you commit to anything. I want you to think about all those things I just mentioned. And then I want you to map out a plan. Like, how am I going to do this in a way where I can have consistent content for a long-term basis. So what's my workflow going to look like? Um, and am I going to do it all myself for a while or, and you know, what, what are the necessities versus like, yeah. the, um, and if I'm going to outsource, what pieces am I going to outsource? So I want them to think deep before they just jump into it and how you can make it like a long-term successful project. Okay. Yeah. Because I mean, consistency builds results essentially. Yeah. I, th I think for, I don't know, everything in life, like yeah. consistency is like one of the key players. Um, Absolutely. So if you could do it all over again, would you do anything differently? No. With the podcast particularly? Yeah. yeah. Maybe a better, mar maybe a little bit of, I, I felt, hmm. Maybe a little bit of a stronger marketing or opt-in at the very beginning. I think we are so busy with the tactical of creating the content and figuring out our workflow. And we had a great launch and it went really well, but like, and we tried the transcripts and that just didn't work for us. Um, so I guess I wouldn't change it because we learned something in that process. It wasn't like we failed. It was just, I yeah. think if I was starting over again, I'd try to think of something a little stronger there. But also if I was starting over again, the tech side wouldn't intimidate me as much as it did then. And I could focus more time on the marketing. So yeah, I, I, I feel like it's kind of like a tricky question. So yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I think we did a nice job with what we knew and what we were doing. And, um, but I think in the beginning it was all about creating the content and I wasn't thinking of how to cross market it as much and how to use it as a sales tool. Okay. Yeah. So guys listening, if you're thinking about getting started with this stuff, like 
take that in consideration yeah. for sure. Um, I know that we went through a whole lot of tools and resources and recommendations. Do you have any other ones that you wanted to mention that maybe we didn't get a chance to hit on? Yeah. So one thing I want to mention for podcast specifically, you don't need a ton of fancy equipment. Like I know there's a ton of different microphones out there. I use a blue Yeti, which is like a pretty, you know, it's under a hundred dollars. There's some that are even cheaper than that. I know there's people that spend hundreds of dollars on a microphone. And in my opinion, when you're starting, like keep it simple and keep your expenses down and you can always buy something fancier later. You know, I, I'm going to probably upgrade my mic at some point soon, but it's been two years, you know, and this one. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, so, test it, see, see if you like doing it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, it does, there are expenses that add up. You need, you need hosting and we use different tech for interviews sometimes, but keep it simple, keep it streamlined. Don't invest in anything fancy and you can always build further onto that later, or invest in new tech tools and things as you grow. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, um, do you have like a link to the microphone that you use? I would love to go ahead and yeah. add that into the notes too. Sure. Yeah. Let me make a note so I write it down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So now the last and the probably most important question is where can people find you online and connect with you and your team? Awesome. Yeah. We are at proof to product.com and you can find our podcast there. You can find our other programming that we do, uh, conferences, courses, my coaching program. Um, uh, but the podcast is at proof to product.com slash podcast. You can also find us on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you listen to your podcasts. And, um, yeah, it's, I really, the podcast has been a total passion project for me. And again, it's grown in ways that I didn't even anticipate. And if you guys are thinking about doing something, um, well, let me, let me mention this. If you're considering doing YouTube or a podcast or a blog series or online classes or webinars or whatever, I want you to like pause and think about what are my natural skills and talents? What do I love doing? What do I feel comfortable doing? Some people don't like videos. Some people don't like talking to other people, you know? And so look at what your core strengths are. I mean, when I was in like fourth grade, I kept getting notes home saying, Katie talks too much in class. Well, <laughs> hello, I now have a podcast and I talk too much. But you know what I mean? Like, look at what your strengths are and dive deep into one thing. And if talking to people or doing your own show um, is something that, you know, talking things out versus writing things out or doing a video is what you like, I 100% recommend you try a podcast because it's a lot of fun and it's a great way to um, connect with a lot of people and build relationships in business. Yeah, for sure. I think that that is really, really helpful advice. And I mean, like, you can also combine that with a blog. Like yeah. if you want to mainly focus on your podcast, but hey, use some of those show notes and put them into blog posts because blog posts do help your Google SEO they for do. your website. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that that's really good advice is just stick to what you feel comfortable with, what you're good at. And if you're not sure yet, try them out. Mm -hmm. Or even be a guest on somebody else's show or do something where you're not having to create it yet, um, you know, but you can test it. Um, the other thing I will say to your point about the content repurposing, I a hundred percent agree with you too of like, so our podcast is like top of the content tree. And then we pull off of that for social posts and emails and blog posts mm -hmm. and, you know, finding that one top of the tree, so to speak, <clears throat> it's, it's incredibly valuable when you do, but you do have to play for a while to figure out what it is that you want to dive deep into. So to your point, Mariah, like play, have fun, figure it out. But once you decide on an area, like go all in on it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that is really, really helpful and it's valuable information. Don't do all the things. No. Don't do them all because it's, you're just going to end up frustrated. No, but, I tried and it was awful. Yeah. I mean, like, no. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, okay. So I'm going to go ahead and add links to the podcast and, you know, all of your social channels, the website, all of the awesome. really fun stuff. So if you want to go ahead and stalk Katie and her team, feel free to do so. <laughs> um, and then Katie, I just want to thank you for being a guest on the Work the Web interview series. I think that we went over a ton of helpful information for people that are curious about starting, growing a podcast, where to find more information, where to get support, um, all of the really good stuff. And then guys, if you're watching, make sure that you check out the other interviews in this work, the web series. I've talked to a lot of really helpful online business owners. I mentioned a few in this episode, um, and they gave us insanely valuable tips on what they focused on that has helped them grow their business in a way that works for them, because that is the most important part. 
Um, and then as always, if you guys enjoyed this video, give it a really quick thumbs up for me. And if you have any questions for me or for Katie, go ahead and comment them right below this video. Reach out to us, leave reviews or comments on podcasts, YouTube, all of it. Um, but other than that, we will talk with you guys next time. Bye. Thanks so much.